Hello chess fans, the Scotch Gambit is a great opening full of tactical and aggressive opportunities for white. Gawain Jones, a top English grandmaster, has a myriad of games in this opening with marvelous results. Here are three of his finest games in the Scotch Gambit. In the first game, Gawain faces the super grandmaster Shakriar Mamedyarov. It starts e4, e5, white develops his knight to f3, attacking the e5 pawn, and black defends it with knight c6. Then Gawain sends us into the Scotch game with d4. White aims to dominate the center by removing black's e pawn. Black doesn't have a great way to maintain the tension so captures the pawn on d4. Bishop c4 by Gawain marks the scotch gambit, prioritizing fast development over recapturing the pawn. Black could attempt to hold on to the pawn with bishop c5, but instead chooses the most popular move, knight f6, hitting e4. White pushes forward with e5. Black counterattacks with d5, and as enticing as it is, en passant is not great because it just allows black to develop. White plays bishop b5, and black plays knight e4. With the knight pinned, Gawain is able to regain the gambit pawn while adding an attacker to the pinned piece. Bishop d7 breaks the pin and defends the knight. White captures the knight to damage black's pawn structure, and to preserve his bishop, black recaptures with the pawn immediately. Gawain castles. Black plays bishop c5, planning to soon do the same. Now it's difficult for white to proceed with his development with black's powerful knight. So white kicks it away with f6, and it goes to g5. Bishop e3 defends his own knight, in anticipation of black's next move, knight e6. f4 comes next, pushing the 4 on 3 majority on the king side. On the other end of the board, queen b8 pressures white's queen side. Gawain unfurls f5, hitting the knight. An interesting line to think about here, is what happens if black takes the b-pawn. White's rook would be trapped since the knight cannot go to either a3 or c3, and if it were to go to d2, that interferes with the queen's defense of the knight. White would be hanging the knight. White would instead take the knight on e6, threatening the bishop with check. Two pieces for a rook is better for white, so white would first recapture the pawn. Then white's best move would be, surprisingly, king h1. This is because after black would take the rook, white would take the bishop on e6, and even though black is winning this bishop on e3, it does not come with check, so white has time to play knight c7, and they'll end up being up material. Back to the game. Given this variation, black's best bet is to initiate this series of exchanges on d4, leading to white's queen defending the pawn on b2. Queen b6 offers an exchange of queens. Gawain cleverly plays c3 so that after black takes the queen, white can recapture with the pawn to support his advanced e-pawn. Now black plays rook b1, and white is in some trouble. If b3, then black would play rook b4, attacking the d4 pawn, and white cannot defend it without surrendering the f5 pawn. Pretty much, white has to choose between the b-pawn and the d-pawn, and he chooses the b-pawn by playing knight d2. Black takes the pawn on b2, and white plays knight b3, constricting the black rook. Since we're in an endgame, black plays king e2, keeping the king in the center and paving the way for black's other rook. White's g4 secures the f-pawn, freeing up white's rook. Black brings the other rook to the open file, and white plays rook f2, forcing black's strong rook to exchange itself off, and white recaptures. At this point, we're in an endgame with black up one pawn, but Gawain's kingside majority will soon storm up the board. Here is where black goes slightly wrong. He plays g6 to challenge white's advanced pawns, but this simply allows f6 check, gaining a boatload of space. King e6 would be an outrageous blunder leading to a nasty knight checkmate. So black's king is forced to the back rank, whereas white's king continues forward. Black plays rook b4, pressuring the base of white's pawn chain. Gawain plays rook d1, adding support. Black's rook c4 looks to infiltrate the second rank, so white plays rook d2. Rook c3 check is easily met by king f4, further activating his king. White's king can soon gobble up these weak kingside pawns, so black plays h6, stopping white's king in its tracks. Gawain continues to push his majority with h4, but this was a big mistake. Black could have played rook h3, and that h-pawn is indefensible. Luckily for white, black plays g5. 
This temporarily sacrifices a pawn, as we see after the pawn exchanges, but black will win the g-pawn back after rook g3. White plays knight c5 before black takes on g4 with check, forcing the king to the side of the board. Gawain is now threatening to remove the defender of the rook, so black retreats the bishop to c8. Despite being down a pawn, white is much better and this becomes clear after rook b2. That rook is coming to the back rank and black's future looks grim. Black takes the d-pawn before white's rook infiltrates. Black is forced to defend the bishop with his king. Here, white has only one move that wins. Can you find it? The move that Gawain plays is e6. If black does not take, then e7 is coming, losing the bishop and eventually leading to a promotion. So in the game, black takes the pawn and white recaptures forking the king and rook. As he will shortly be down a significant chunk of material, black resigns. The next opponent is the strong Danish international master Christian Pedersen. Gawain launches the sconch gambit with bishop c4 and black again replies with the most popular move knight f6. White hits the knight with e5 and black counters with d5. White pins the knight with bishop b5 and black leaps forward with knight e4. White's knight takes d4 exploits the pin on the knight prompting black to break it with bishop d7. Gawain takes the knight, damaging black's pawn structure before he brings his king to safety by castling. Black develops his bishop, and white plays f6 to dislodge black's powerful knight. It goes to g5. White plays bishop e3, anchoring his own knight on d4. And since you were paying close attention, you notice that this game has been following the last game up until this point. Last time, black played knight e6, but this time, black castles. Both moves are just fine. Gawain proceeds f4, giving black the opportunity to return the knight to d4. White plays knight d2, and black shouldn't allow white to capture the knight because the resulting pawn on e4 would be difficult to defend. For that reason, he initiates the exchange and white recaptures with the queen. Black develops his queen and defends his own bishop, and white plays rook a to e1, lining up his rook with the black queen. Black's bishop b6 prepares to thrust forward with c5. Then Gawain plays a tricky move, f5. This hangs the e-pawn, which black takes, but it allows a clever tactic. Knight takes c6. Black cannot recapture since it would allow white to take the bishop on b6, opening a discovered attack on the queen. Black plays queen d6 instead. White captures the bishop on b6, and black chooses to take the knight. After white saves his bishop, we are left with equal material and an imbalance of opposite colored bishops. Black plays rook e8, challenging the open file, and Gawain shifts his rook over to attack the black d-pawn. Black plays rook e5, simultaneously defending the pawn and attacking the f-pawn. White's response, f6, puts black in a pickle. Recapturing would ruin black's kingside, creating opportunities for a white attack. He instead doubles his rooks on the e-file. Gawain unfurls bishop c3, attacking the rook, and it slides over to h5. Then white captures the g-pawn, now defended by the bishop. Black plays queen b6, check, and white blocks with his queen. Black captures and white recaptures with the rook. Black's c5 threatens d4, which would remove the defense of the g-pawn. So white fastens it into place with bishop f6. Bishop g4 hits the white rook, so white doubles them on the f-file. Black plays rook e6, and Gawain begins a clever plan. b4 does several things. First of all, it gives the white bishop a square to retreat to, since we already know why it couldn't go to c3. Once black recaptures, white brings the bishop back, opening a discovered attack on f7. Black has to defend it, and rook e7 is the only way. Finally, white can play rook f4 to win back the pawn by way of a double attack. Black saves his bishop, and white takes the pawn. Black plays rook e2, and things start to go incredibly wrong for him. Gawain plays rook b8, threatening and pinning the bishop to the king. And black probably thought that rook takes c2 is enough to defend. But unfortunately for him, after white's rook to c1, he is done for. Either black moves the rook off the c-file, or exchanges rooks, both of which will lead to white winning the bishop. And there's just no way to stop that. Given that white will be up a full piece with a dominant position, black resigns. 
The final opponent is the strong grandmaster Arkady Nidich. The game proceeds through the opening just like the other two, which is the one of the great things about the Scotch game and Scotch Gambit. You don't need to know as much theory since the games generally start out in the same way. On move 9, instead of bishop c5, black plays bishop e7. Gawain responds with his patented f3 kicking the knight, followed by f4 anchoring his pawn on e5 and prompting black to return the knight to e4. White aggressively pushes forward with f5. Black retaliates with c5, kicking the knight to e2, and continues with bishop b5 pinning the knight to the rook. Gawain launches the a-pawn to attack the bishop, who tucks itself away on a6. White follows with knight c3, and although after the exchange, white's pawn structure has gone awry, at least black's dominant knight is off the board. Black plays queen d7, supposedly planning to castle queenside. White plays rook f2, getting out of the pin, and indeed, black castles queenside. Gawain's knight leaps to f4, and black could actually take the f5 pawn, since there are no good discovered attacks. Taking on d5 would just put white in a horrible pin. Instead, black plays g5, and white's knight goes to h5. The threat now is to play f6 and then win the g5 pawn. So black plays rook g8, defending it. Gawain blockades the queenside with queen g4, putting a stop to black's pawn storm. Black plays king b1, trying to get his king to safety. Bishop d2 is followed by king a8, tucking the king away in the corner. White's rook e1 looks to push forward in the middle, potentially creating a passed pawn. Black follows with bishop c4, interfering with white's defense of the a pawn. White responds by pushing the pawn one square to safety. Then black puts the rook on the open b file. Gawain gives his king some air with h3, and black plays h6 to secure his pawn on g5. White's queen f3 aims to give black's king trouble on the long diagonal. Black plays queen c8 just in case the diagonal were to open up so he could block check with the queen instead of putting his rook in a pin. Knight g3 comes next, opening up this square for the white queen. After rook e8, Gawain is able to play queen h5, forking two pawns. Black plays f6 and white captures on h6. Rook h8 forces white's queen to its only available square, g7, where it attacks the black bishop. Queen d8 defends it. White plays queen f7, pinning the d-pawn to the bishop. This would allow white to play something like knight e4 if he wanted. Black continues by taking the pawn on e5. This prompts white to push f6, and after the bishop defends itself, white can now win the undefended g-pawn. With white's queen having already ravaged the king side, black decides it's finally time to get rid of her. White accepts the queen exchange offer, and black's recapture puts white's bishop under attack. h4 secures it. Black's e4 opens a discovered attack on the knight, so it leaps to f5. Black saves the bishop and attacks the pawn on c3. Gawain ignores this, correctly evaluating that his three passed pawns will prove decisive. Bishop takes c3 is met with the counterattack rook e3. After black saves the bishop, white plays knight e7, attacking the rook and preparing to push his pawn to glory. Black's rook swoops over to the b-file where it can infiltrate white's back rank. Gawain is unfazed, playing knight g6 with a fork. Black counterattacks with d4. Here white plays a stunning move. He takes the bishop on e5, sacrificing his own rook. He then has to recapture the pawn since he doesn't want to lose the second rook. Now if black were to save his bishop, say with bishop e6, then white's pawns would march forward, and it's pretty much impossible to stop them, with this being one of the possible variations, leading to white being up a bunch of material. Back to the game, black correctly assesses that he has to capture the h-pawn while he still can, even though it gives up the second bishop. We are now in a position where white has two pieces for a rook. Black plays rook b1 check, and after king g2, wins the g4 pawn with check. King h3 attacking the rook is followed by rook g8, threatening rook h1, which would eventually win the rook after rook h8. Gawain finds the only defensive resource, king h2, stopping the rook from coming to h1. King b7 is followed by f7, and the pawn promotion is soon becoming a reality. 
Rook f8 is easily met with bishop c5, forcing the rook off the f file and it goes to h8 with check. White plays king g2 and black tries rook b to h1 hoping for any possibility of a perpetual check. But there just isn't a way. Gawain makes a queen and with the significant material advantage that white will soon have, Black decides that now is the time to give up, and he resigns. I hope these games were both entertaining and instructive. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for more chess content.